Good afternoon. It is a pleasure, uh, my distinguished honor, just to be on a panel with these three gentlemen. Um, first is Austin Obashahan. He's the superintendent of the Duplin School District. Then there's, um, I effectively call him Danny King, but it's Daniel King, superintendent of Far San Juan Alamo. Um, going forward, we're gonna say PSJA. <laughs> and then last but not least, Antoine Wilson, who is the assistant superintendent for post-secondary readiness from the Denver Public Schools. I'm LaVon Sheffield, I am a former superintendent and have served in numerous capacities in um, K-12 as well as community college. I'd invite you to look at the back of your program if you want more information on these, these gentlemen. Um, they have quite interesting histories. So to start off, um, I'd ask each of them to briefly give you some background on their um, school district so there, there's a context to our conversation. Antoine, you want to start? Uh, thanks, Levon. Um, as you mentioned, I am uh, in Denver Public Schools. Denver Public Schools is a school district with about uh, 88,000 students. Um, and uh, we've uh, just uh, reassumed the, the label as the largest school district in, in the state of Colorado. Actually, we're the fastest growing school district in the country. So um, we've um, added about 18,000 students over the last, over the last uh, five years. Uh, my office is the Office of Post-Secondary Readiness. We have middle school, elementary schools, and um, um, high schools, every level. Uh, we also have all our college readiness work and uh, turnaround work that all rolls, up into, um, all rolls up into our office. I have an opportunity to work with uh, about eight um, leaders of school uh, networks, and uh, as well as executive directors that, that, that lead the various offices in our district. Okay. Yes, uh, PSJ is a tri-city school district serving three uh, communities on the Texas-Mexico border down in the very southern tip of Texas. And we serve about 32,000 students. 99% uh, of these students are Latino or Hispanic and close to 90% are economically uh, disadvantaged. Um, we look there at, uh, at early college as something not to be an, exp uh, an experience for some students who get chosen to go there, but as something for all students and as a method of systemic transformation. We're working very hard at uh, scaling that opportunity throughout our, our school district um, from with uh, different types of uh, strategies from a dropout recovery, uh, dual enrollment dropout recovery high school for 18 to 26 year olds that has graduated a th almost 1,200 students in the last few years uh, through connecting them to the community college while they get their high school diploma, to a standalone uh, STEM early college high school that's had its first two graduating classes, uh, which is located not on a college campus, but in the community, bringing the college to us. The first two graduating classes have had over 70% of the students earn an associate degree uh, by the time they uh, graduate from, uh, from high school. And then scaling this across, we have a, over 8,000 uh, uh, high school students we have four different uh, early college uh, high school models, school within a school, large school, school-wide. Um, this semester we have over 3,000 uh, students duly enrolled in college. Our goal uh, this year is to have about 500 of our students should walk the college stage by the time they graduate from high school, about half of those with an associate degree, half with a certificate. All of our associate degree students are going on and enrolling in four year and aiming at, uh, at uh, postgraduate studies within two years. We hope to have about half of our high school graduates, about a thousand students a year crossing the college stage by the time they uh, cross, uh, by the time they graduate from, from high school. Thank you, Dean. Dr. O? Yes, uh, on behalf of Duplin County Schools, I want to thank Joe for the future and uh, North Carolina New Schools Project for having us, thank you. Um, very fortunate to work in a wonderful school district with about 10,000, approximately 10,000 students. Uh, we're growing. Um, we have one early college and four traditional high schools. Um, we in the rural of North Carolina and are very rich in agriculture. Our student population is evenly distributed. We have one third Hispanic students, one third white students, and one third black students. Uh, we also uh, have very 
uh, close niche community who believes in the education of children and have a shared vision of giving every child an opportunity to, to achieve success. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we, we have embraced the culture, uh, college going culture for all students. Uh, the three of you are various places on the um, early college spectrum. You have whole school district, whole, whole district reform. Danny, you're, you're scaling up to whole district and then you're doing major expansion in Denver. I, I'd ask you guys, what are the lessons you learn? What are the miscues? I, um, I'm sure everyone in this audience wants to make sure they don't step in the same pothole that you stepped in. <laughs> and so what advice would you uh, give everyone in the room around scale? How do you scale up early college in, in your district? You wanna start, Austin? Yes. Um, I, I think for us, the, the critical piece was the support of we have from New Schools Project. Uh, we didn't go into this uh, on our own. But I think you have to also understand, that make sure your community, your staff, your, your, your family members are ready for that. You can't go shopping without everybody in the house know where you're going and how, what we're gonna do. So getting the buy-in is critically important and having the type, type of support and resources that our teachers and staff would need to have in place in order to have a successful uh, transformation and initiative. And I would agree that you know great great partners is is you know very foundational to all of this work. Um, you need a great college partner, which we're very fortunate to have in South Texas College that is very open to working with us. Um, also, uh, Educate Texas and Jobs for the Future are you know are very helpful and very instrumental uh, in this work. So having good partners to both work with you and to critique um, what you're doing is, is very critical. And also a realization that um, there is not, especially if you're talking about scaling to all, um, you, you're gonna have to find a lot of different ways, especially if you're dealing with a um, large, large number of students. There's not a, an exact uh, pattern or recipe and you will probably stumble some, I know we have, and, uh, and have to figure out um, how, how to rework things to make sure students are connect, uh, successfully connected to and through college. Well, I just, just add uh, this in terms of building on, it's the importance of leadership. Importance of people who truly believe that all mm -hmm. students deserve an opportunity to, um, to, to go to college, to do not buy into the arguments and the statements that um, we shouldn't be providing students these types of opportunities because they will not go. Um, one thing that we cannot do is work around uh, leaders who do not have a strong and deep desire to uh, provide opportunities for every kid. And so um, if, I were to, if I were to advise any of you, it's uh, to not make any concessions in, in the areas of leadership. That's both the people who lead your school buildings, but that's also the individuals who are supporting those leaders and those teachers uh, in the school buildings. So I'll start with you, Antoine. Obviously, I'm familiar with Denver. Uh, when you do, you, when you move your um, early college to scale, what does that say? Um, and I get, I need all three of you to really think about it because it's very close right now for us and the work we're doing with I three. What does it say about systemic transformation? How does your district, your infrastructure, have to change to support these schools that are doing something innovative uh, and and they're taking risks? So what what does that say? Well, you know, I think for Denver, what it it, what it means, I mean, you know, I mentioned 88,000 um, students in, in Denver. We're, we're known as a district to be um, quite innovative, and we have, we're an open enrollment district. Kids can go to any school uh, in the state, and um, as a city, we are um, pretty innovative in terms of um, giving schools the opportunity to breathe and then trying to identify the proper supports. So the challenge with uh, that type of model mm -hmm. is that um, sometimes there is support fatigue on the part of the schools. I mean, there's just so many right. different uh, people who want to come into the school and support in some meaningful way as in a school. You're trying to figure out how do we discriminate from all these offers of support. And so I think that for us, um, you know, a lot of that is really about trying to align the, the, the resources, making sure that um, the people who are leading our uh, school networks and supporting our principals, that they are, they are able to ha um, have a structure of uh, supporting those schools so that everything's aligned. And uh, really trying to get, empower our leaders to uh, know when to say no on certain things and to try to make sure that there's real clarity in terms of what this should look like in the classroom. Because ultimately that's where um, the, the rubber meets the road in all these initiatives is what do teachers understand about the work? 
And then how does this show up in the classrooms and the everyday lessons that they teach with students? Right. Danny, why don't you share with us what you've been doing to uh, use um, Anton's work to align your organization in support of early college and the new Austin? Yes, and uh, I, I, I agree that uh, alignment in the, in the support is very, uh, very important. And uh, in, in, in PSJ, what we've been working very much on is trying to move the different um, departments out of, let's say, silos. Uh, often uh, different departments, different initiatives are hitting the campuses and they may f feel pulled this way and that way. So what we've done is basically uh, aligned into kind of a combined team that, uh, that works together uh, no, no matter which, whether they're at, of course, in our area, uh, the bilingual department is very significant, for example, and the early college people and the curriculum people where they go together, special education work together with the campus so that they're getting one unified message. And the goal of everyone on the team is to get our students connected to college, to get them, to get them ready, and to get them to and through college, and so that it's one unified effort. It's, it's the same thing or similar to in Duplin County. We, uh, we we're very fortunate in Duplin County where it really is a shared vision. Mm -hmm. It's not just an individual vision, but a community vision. And um, we are unified behind that common purpose, that common goal of, of providing this, the support for our students to be successful. So we, across the spectrum, across the community, and across the school system, the belief is that every child will have the same opportunity. This is what we have to do. It's not just an initiative, it's the way, it's, it's the way of doing things. It became a culture in our community, in our school system. So we all have the same direction, the same goal, and with a strong relationship we have with James Brown Community College, which has been outstanding for the past many, many years, really transformed into and translated into a very positive and solid support where we all speak the same language and uh, stand behind the same vision. As I move around the country, I often find that the financial commitment to early college is, is lacking. And so when you have to make uh, tough choices when you're a superintendent, what are the trade-offs so you can maintain your commitment to early college for all, just not for some, but for all? You want me to start again? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You need a few more minutes to think that through? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, it's a challenge, but that would not stop us in Duplin. It didn't stop us because we believe that um, the success of our children is critically important, that we're not going to allow anything to get in the way of that. Uh, so we started in Duplin, for example, we started building the collaboration, changing the mindset, and sometimes resources is very important, but we believe also, since we don't have the resources, we have to do something. And we started changing the, the mindset, the culture of raising high expectations, uh, uh, providing professional development, uh, reaching out to community partners to see what they can do to, to support us. Uh, but it is a challenge. The financial piece is, is a challenge, but I guess all you have to do is reach out to community business partnership and see what we can do to bring those into our school system. But make no mistake about it, resources or no resources, we are moving forward. Dan? Yes, and the first is to, to understand the, the critical nature of the work. Um, our, our community is in a region uh, down the southern tip of Texas. It's where the poverty levels are among the highest in the, in the nation, the unemployment rates among the highest, the educational attainment levels among the lowest. Um, we've got to, to completely uh, turn, turn that around. And uh, so there's several things involved. One goes back to your earlier question, which is aligning the work. So when you align the resources in the different departments so that they're all aligned towards one common goal, then you can bring funding streams together. And so that's one way. Uh, having a great college partner in our case that waives uh, the tuition is, is another way. And other ways is simply prioritizing the work and going through and every year because we're, we're scaling. We're going, like I said, we're going from starting with a few hundred students in dual enrollment to 3,000 this semester to probably 3,500 this spring and, 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 and on. And buying textbooks and all of those things. So we're constantly going through our budget and looking at um, both uh, looking at where we can um, be more efficient in support services, be more efficient in the different uh, you know, resources that, uh, that we use and how we use them, 
So it takes, it takes constant uh, attention to, you know, what is our number one priority? Jim Levon, what I would uh, share in terms of Denver is, you know, a lot of the outcomes that uh, we have that measure the success of the school district speak to the success of students coming out of high school and their preparedness for success after high school. So in Denver, um, a lot of our schools are measured based on the success. And so when we start thinking about what to cut and what to keep, um, certainly don't want to cut those, those programs that are going to impact their ability to demonstrate that they are graduating students and that they are prepared. Um, the other piece is really getting the city to understand the importance of education in, in, terms, of the, in terms of the community being a great community. You know, Denver, one of the things that we want to do is we want to be a world-class city, and uh, we believe we are a world-class city, and in order to do that, we have to provide a world-class education. And so as you get people to um, understand that and to understand uh, all that comes with it, then um, what ends up happening, at least what has happened in Denver, is a great deal of support in terms of uh, the efforts to, to, to scale up early college. The other piece is partnerships, and, and that was mentioned already in, in, in terms of the importance of um, producing uh, partnerships. And then kids, uh, our students actually have to believe that when they finish that they're actually going to be able to pay for school um, beyond what they got with us. And so fortunately for us, we do have Denver Scholarship Foundation. Um, which is a uh, grant uh, uh, provided by um, private citizens, and, um, and that allows those students to know that they're going to be able to pay for school beyond what they have for us, and uh, I think that that makes a tremendous difference as well. All right, Antoine, I want to start with you on this one. Um, some districts are blessed with uh, significant um, uh, grants, uh, gifts. Um, I'd call it initiative fatigue. Not, I'm not the only one who calls it initiative fatigue. And here comes early college. And this very strong commitment that you have to scale up and Danny and Austin have to scale up early college. What do you do? What are your strategies that you use um, to bring about this transformation so folks just don't say, this is one more thing, I just have to, uh, you, you know how we do in education, just one more thing, I, I'll do is live past her, right. and we don't have to worry about it. Right. You know, I think that's an excellent question and I think it's a very real question. Um, when you really think about it, I mean, we're really good at uh, trying something for a year, two, or three, and then moving on to the next thing. And so I think that um, uh, many school leaders, many teachers, um, that is a real question that they should be asking. I mean, I think a big part of it is really trying to focus on the daily business of what's happening in the classroom. And uh, we talked a moment about um, alignment, but, you know, and, and you were talking earlier, uh, or at least there was a session earlier talking about the Common Core. Um, I think all of those coming together really creates an opportunity for us to really think about how all of this can be uh, uh, combined to help us get the types of outcomes for kids that we're trying to get. And so we really want to uh, try to get our schools to focus on really we're asking one thing. Right. And the one thing that we're asking um, is that we prepare all of our students to, be, uh, to graduate college and career ready. And then what are the strategies that we're going to use to help, uh, to, to help them get there? And so um, if we can get our schools to, you know, in Colorado that we have unified improvement plans, and um, it's basically a, a statewide process for school improvement plans. And what we try to do is we try to get our schools to fo get focused on what's in their plan. And you're going to go to a lot of sessions, get a lot of training, and hear a lot of different things. But keep in mind that what you're implementing is what's in your plan. And if there's something that you hear that helps inform your plan or helps you think differently about your plan, then certainly use it. But if it, if it doesn't uh, align to your plan, then you have a right to filter that out and stay focused on that. And then we have a number of tools that we use within our district. Um, our, our leaders of, of, of schools use a unified improvement plan tracker to make sure that we're talking about the school improvement plan every time we're going into the school and uh, just staying focused on that and uh, really trying to help schools think, th think through what not to do. Sometimes we have to help school leaders, we have to protect school leaders from themselves <laughs> as well in terms of uh, some of the things that they want to do. Hey, look, I was a principal, I know all about it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I want my, my kids to be great, and so we try this, we try that, but just saying, no, this is what we said we're going to focus on, um, and uh, this initiative, I think, helps provide a frame for all of that other work versus uh, being in addition to the other work. Very, very much in, uh, in, in agreement with, uh, with that. In, in PSJ, we kind of, uh, the way we frame all of our work, uh, we call it college cubed which stands for all students college ready, college connected, and college complete. And so all the work that we do, when grant opportunities come, when everything else, the first thing we do is look, through it, look at it through that lens. And uh, so we look at the opportunity and say, can, can this 
opportunity be aligned to this? We often reframe or, or write our grant applications to align and support this work. If it just absolutely cannot, then we'll take a, take a pass on that and we won't because you can have your system thrown off track by applying for unrelated things or, 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 or taking on initiatives that just take you in a completely, in a completely different, uh, different direction. So having that uh, in mind, and like I said, for us, we put in that very simple framework of, of, uh, of college cubed or, or, or college to the third power and really focus on getting our students to and through getting them to, uh, to complete college. And then the other thing about grants, of course, and, and funding sources and initiatives is being able to sustain so that it's not a short-term thing. And then how are you going to continue the, the work of this, uh, of this initiative if the grant goes away in three years or in two years or whatever? So how do you systematize it so that it, so that it is going to continue? Um, in Duplin County, uh, we were very fortunate at the time when we were getting ready to develop our five-year strategic plan as, and uh, the common code came out and, uh, and then this district what early college. So this all happened at the same time. So we all developed, that was part of our strategic plan. So it became a way of life for us. It became, a, it was a shared vision and a, a shared commitment to ensuring that we that become a reworking document, not something you just put on the shelf. And, uh, and, and the accountability piece to that is every year we also report to the community, all stakeholders, about where we are on the, on the strategic plan and where, what we need to do differently. So it became something that everybody was aware of. Uh, in terms of grant, um, we have a very wonderful grant writer who helps us uh, explore grant opportunities out there and what we try to do is try to align, make sure whatever we do is aligned to our strategic plan. So in that case, we, 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 we pursue federal grants, local grants, and even business grants as much as we can. I think the other thing for us, for Dublin County School that I'm very fortunate about is, and I, I know not many superintendents have that kind of opportunity, I'm very blessed, that we have cabinet members and principals who are willing to reprioritize our budgeting process so that we can raise the level of funding for towards this, 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 this uh, uh, transformation initiative. So that really was very, very critical for us. All our staff members was open to that conversation. So You are truly fortunate. Very fortunate. <laughs> um, Antoine, you're from a large school district. Um, Danny's from a mid-site school district. In Austin, you're from a, a smaller district. Pros and cons versus um, whole school, I mean whole district implementation versus scaling school by school, and does size really matter? I'd offer, whoever wants to start. Well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll start talking about Denver. I mean, I think that for us it'd be great to be able to um, say we're going to do something entire district, but you know, I think that um, the challenge with, uh, for us with that is in Denver, the history of saying we're going to have one thing happen across the entire district a particular way has been that those initiatives have failed. And uh, what's been pointed to is not the, uh, the inability of the district to think thoughtfully as to how to scale it up. Um, it, it, what's, what's happened is the initiative has been pointed to as being a, a flawed initiative. Um, I think that this, is, this work is too important for us to um, allow that to happen. Uh, in Denver Public Schools, uh, so where um, we could uh, be in a position where people say, well, you know what's wrong is this idea that all kids should be prepared for, for college. What we've done is this. We've said that uh, we've established a college and career readiness office. We've had this office even before we decided to uh, pursue uh, um, this relationship. And we said that um, all of our schools are going to provide students with opportunities to, to graduate from college with college credit. That was the initial piece. We'll measure that. We'll hold you accountable for that. We'll evaluate you on that. And then what we try to do is create the space for schools to go faster, faster than what we're thinking about, what we were thinking about doing. And that's what's happened. We've had some um, school leaders and some communities, some teachers, educators, parents, who said, you know, we want to be uh, one of the best um, in terms of uh, the city, one of the best in terms of the country, and we want to learn from uh, great implementations happening nationally. And so what we try to do is create the space for that to flourish, for that to happen. Um, and at the same time, saying to the other schools, you, um, there's a minimum expectation that we have for you in terms of your development. So um, I think it'd be great to be in a position where you can grow, um, but I also think that you have to pay attention to your local context and recognize what the history has been. 
um, because uh, you know I certainly believe in going extremely fast in terms of a lot of the things, but you can you can outpace your uh, your team, and uh, want to make sure that you don't do that as you are uh, as you're doing your uh, doing your work that you don't move so fast that that uh, you look back, look around you and the, and, the, and there's no one running with you. Yes, and I have you know I have kind of the perspective of having been both in a, in a much smaller district. Uh, I was superintendent of the Hidalgo Independent School District, uh, a student of about 3,000 students with a high school of about 800, where we uh, began the first, I believe what was probably the first early college or early college school district or early college for all initiative uh, uh, in, in the country. And so having worked on it in that small setting and then going to a district 10 times larger, um, the commitment was there that we were going to do this, but the how to, uh, you know, figuring out how, you know, how to do it, and you know, a, a couple of different things. There, one of the first things that we did is when we sit, worked on an uh, early college high school, our first early college high school, we set it up initially right away in the partnership with our different partners that it would be not just an early college high school, but it would be a laboratory for all of our high schools to figure out how to scale this up district wide. So we set it up as a laboratory setting to learn from and for uh, and and so we had regular principal meetings there for them to principals to understand the work that was going on and uh, you know and and how to scale that up and as we've done that local context is very important also um, the district was going through a, a lot of major issues from being uh, uh, having huge dropout problems which uh, have the district has gone from a dropout rate double the state average to about half the state average in the last few years now but huge dropout uh, problems, governance issues, a lot of uh, challenges that have been taking place in that district. So there were a lot of things that had to be worked on at the same time. I think the important thing is persistence, maybe stubbornness in a certain extent. Uh, this is my seventh year in the school district, and every year I always feel like we're two or three years behind where I wish we were, but where every year we're moving forward and, and, uh, and it's expanding and it's scaling, and it's, it's, a, it's a commitment from a, from a team and a commitment from a community that we're gonna get this done. And we're going to trip, and we're going to stub our toe, and you know we're going to have these different things. But we're going to get up and figure it out and move on to the next step. And so, even when you talk about local context, not only local context, but if you're in a larger system, each part of the community, each uh, my community has three different cities in it, and each of those cities has different dynamics also. But and each different high school will have a different dynamic. But we're working on different models from from uh, our, our what used to be called alternative campuses which are kind of our back on track to college models to to uh, to uh, large comprehensive high schools how to work with those with a school within a school or or campus-wide scale up and we're working through different ways of doing it at different campuses and then learning from those and transferring that learning from one campus to the other in Duplin uh, the size doesn't matter um, the local context is also very important we have about one third of our population, adult population, who have either received uh, a high school diploma uh, or less. That means you have two thirds did not go to, who did not go to college. Mm -hmm. So size is not important. What is important, the important question is, do you have any one of those 9,000 students that you want to leave behind? And, and our answer to that as a community is no, we have none. So we have to first of all start looking at resources because of limited resources, looking at partnership, looking at what is it that is scalable? What is it that we can do right now, this moment? And, and, and if you look at instructional design, I mean instructional framework and the design principles that have been mentioned in previous sessions, you see that all of those things are scalable. And I think sometimes when we talk about innovation, we think it's all about changing, changing uh, uh, new ideas. New ideas are also good. But we need to be bold enough and courageous enough to examine our current institutional practices. And, and I think that's what Duplin County School has done. We look at our institutional practices and how these design principles have transformed our thinking and redefined the professionalism. Professional teachers need to be able to teach in a professional environment and behave in a professional way, which would then in turn uh, bring about respect to the profession. So we, because of all of that, we believe that the size does not matter. And, and for us, it doesn't. All 9,000 students deserve the same opportunity. We have a very success story 
at our early college, about 98% of our graduation rate, who don't want to put their child in that school? If it's working for <laughs> one child, why not? Right. So uh, that is the perspective of Duplin County. Well, we'd like for the audience to join us in this conversation. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, Knowledge Works has a subsidiary called Strive Together, uh, which is about creating cradle to career communities. And so, one of the things I'm interested in is how do you, what are you guys doing in your community to sort of have joint accountability for the work that you're doing? Yeah, uh, yeah I'll start. Um, so, you know, in Denver, we're very fortunate to have a very supportive uh, educational uh, environment. Um, you know, we're, we're challenged in a number of different ways, um, but we're also blessed in, 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 in uh, several other. Um, Denver, Colorado is one of the most educated states in the country. The challenge is that many of those, those, those folks are coming in from uh, out, of, out of state. But what has happened is while our mayor does not have control of the school uh, system, um, we have uh, an elected uh, school board with a superintendent. Um, we have a very strong partnership with our city and with the mayor. And so what that has led to is, um, with, our, with our current mayor, is a uh, district city compact around education. It's looking at pre-K education, how to expand options for, for, for students. Um, we've uh, had a, a number of uh, initiatives uh, that have passed over so recent bond and, and, and mill levy that has uh, given additional money to pre-K also to uh, adding more seats at kindergarten and pre-k full day kindergarten for kids and at the same time that same initiative um, allowed us to expand opportunities um, for career and technical education um, for instance so um, we've had uh, we've had uh, the good fortune of having uh, the recognition in our city that we need to do both very much in early stages though as, as, as far as i'm concerned in terms of the work because uh, a lot of it it does involve uh, business leaders who are uh, willing to provide some paid internships for kids um, in order to, uh, to really get them excited. We do have some schools that, uh, that have set that up. Matter of fact, I have one here uh, today, uh, uh, with us here uh, today and tomorrow, who uh, is leading in that regard. Um, but uh, we are very fortunate to have those partnerships with the city and county of, uh, of Denver. Danny? Yes. Um, also, probably in earlier stages compared to the rest of the work, but I think several different things as far as uh, as far as uh, you know, uh, you know, cradle through adulthood and everything like that. Um, we we have a very strong uh, early childhood program. We also have a partnership with our uh, our Head Start uh, in the community, where we provide a classroom teacher for half a day for every Head Start classroom. Um, we also are scaling up a very strong our adult education program. Um, uh, in about two weeks, we're going to be starting with 1,500 adults in our community taking ESL and GD programs uh, uh, due to a scale up that we have uh, sponsored in addition to the programs that are already going. We have a lot of partnerships with different nonprofits, uh, churches in the community, our economic development uh, 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 corporations or councils for each city in our cities. Also in our region, uh, we're involved in an initiative, uh, uh, really a scale-up initiative uh, called, uh, it's a collective impact across the Rio Grande Valley, across the two count, county area, where we have close to a dozen school districts and five higher education institutions that are partnering together uh, on the goal of really impacting uh, college completion and uh, really scaling the early college model, which has already started to scale in our region uh, in our, uh, just in uh, right around where we are, there are about 15 early college high schools uh, pretty much within, with, within our county and some in the neighboring county. So really partnering with other school districts, nonprofits, and different ways to, uh, to scale up this work and, and, and partnering with uh, many people in our community and reaching down to early childhood and up into adult education. Just to add to, to some of the things my colleague has mentioned, it, for us in Duplin County Schools, it is pre-K all the way through high school, pre-K to it. So we, we start very early, so we, we have to build that foundation, that partnership, uh, and we call it a seamless approach. 
So uh, the partnership, business partnership is also very important and the James Brown Community Partnership, like I said earlier, been very strong for many years. So it has an established foundation, a partnership already in place for both accountability and also sustainability. So um, we're very fortunate to have that. And, and I think that um, there are many aspects of our community who are now becoming part of this, what we're doing and, and holding us accountable as, as well. I think the key is, being, is to be transparent as well. When you have transparent conversation and transparent and shared vision, then there is that um, sh shared accountability as well. Any other questions? Yes. I just wanted to um, ask the panelists a question. I, I've heard a lot of conversation during this panel about scaling up and that size isn't important. And that seems to be a contradiction to what I understand as one of the hallmarks of the design principles of early colleges, that they are small so that you don't lose that personalization. Hmm. You know, so I, I, I'll start in terms of, in terms of Denver. Uh, in terms of our work, we have schools of all different sizes that we are, um, are um, uh, engaged in this work in. And, and several of them are small schools. Um, but what we're really trying to think about is how do you provide some of the opportunities in terms of personalization, in terms of uh, making sure that you build the connections with students, the relationships with students in a way that makes sense in a larger school. And so a lot of times what you have in your larger comprehensive schools is, uh, you know, treating all kids the same. And which, which is, a, is, is a challenge because then you can't meet their individual needs because they, they aren't all the same. Um, and then giving them a great deal of choice all the way through school. And, and, and what ends up happening in many of our large schools is they get just enough choice to do themselves a lot of harm. And so um, what we're really trying to think about is how do you break down, although it may be a lot of students in the school, how do you create some unique personal uh, learning opportunities, smaller learning opportunities for students to connect with teachers and build those connections all the way through um, high school and so I may be in a school with, their, with, with 1,600 kids, but I'm in a cohort of kids that may only be 125 students. So um, it's really trying to get, uh, trying to get uh, schools to think about things that way. Also trying to rebrand how we think about counseling. So our um, district counseling efforts are within our College and Career Readiness Office and really trying to expand the ways we provide that outreach to, um, to students and trying to build up uh, what advisement looks like and trying to improve those structures as well. So um, again, you can be in a very large uh, a school and begin to think about how do we make this so that it doesn't feel like such a large school to kids and to parents. And I would, I would uh, maybe rephrase in terms of, maybe instead of size doesn't matter, to that size shouldn't be an excuse or a barrier to doing what's right for, for all the students. So then it's a matter of figuring out how. And there are, there are strengths and weaknesses to a large school and to, and to a small school. And so it's figuring out how, how you take those and, and build on those. So within a big large school, as Antoine said, you can, you can break up a large school in different ways. And uh, one of the things that we do within our lar large schools, and so we use a school within a school model, and what we work on having is having a, an administrator and a counselor focus on a cohort of students, on a vertical cohort of students with, within that school. And uh, as, 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 as those students go, go through the, they get the, they get the advantage uh, of, of the small school attention by having that, that uh, vertical cohort and, uh, but yet they have the advantage of, 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 of a large school or a large system where there are a lot of options. I, I worked in a, in, a, in a small school district doing, uh, early, doing college for all or early college for all. And one of the limitations was the variety of uh, opportunities or areas of study that you could offer students. Within a large system, one of the things that we do, we even bus students from, you know, from site to site. And you know, we bus students to the college. We bring college teachers to the campus, our teachers teach the courses. Um, we cluster students from multiple high schools onto one high school campus, so there's all different ways to deal with, 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 with structure. The, the main thing is at the end that the students are, are prepared, that they're successful, that they, that they are able to complete college, and 
we believe in uh, stackability. We, what we've emphasized to them is start college now, complete early to go far. So we teach them whatever level you can get to while you're with us. That's just the beginning. You need to go on to the, to the next level from there. I was the one who said that uh, size doesn't matter. Yes, I, 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 I still stand with that. Um, because it really, let's look at it this way. Instead of looking at it as an initiative, maybe we should look at it as a strategy. That's maybe one way I can help explain that. Even now, we have, in traditional schools, we're talking about size and size. It's, it is about the strategy. It's about the attitude. It's about the teaching. It's about the delivery. And, and all of these things ha have a part to play. For us in Duplin County, so other schools may be different, but for us in Duplin County, the question is this. Size, what, what is the really, does the benefit of our children benefiting from a courageous movement outweighs the barrier? We know we're going, whatever implementation, we're going to have implementation problems in everything you do. But we're not going, we say in Duplin, we're not going to allow that implementation problem create a barrier for us because it's a success of every child because how will our superintendent cannot sit in the school system or any organization to see our children benefiting from a very, very transformative strategy and don't expose other children to that opportunity, whatever it takes. So we have to be creative, we have to be innovative, we have to be transformative, whatever we want to call it, let's do it. So that's, that's the Duplin County School perspective. I guess I, I respond um, this way. Um, I struggle with this notion all of the time. But if we say all means all, the children, our sweet spot, are children who will fall through the cracks. They're minority children who are warehoused in large urban areas in schools that are 1,800, 2,000. I can't write them off. So we developed back on track programs. We developed variations on the theme for early college so we can get you through entry math and entry um, English. So we, you don't get caught in developmental courses in community college. So if you struggle and you really do believe, and, and to me, that is an issue. If you really believe that all children can move to some place better, I'm with Austin, Danny, and Antoine. You do what you have to do to move that school. Any more questions? <laughs> uh, you're, you actually are sitting with uh, three dynamic leaders. Um, Danny was superintendent of the year. Um, Austin has fought to bring success to all of his schools, wherever he has been. And I've heard Antoine tell his folk, I'm using this to bring alignment to our district to make sense of our org chart in support of children. And you don't know, if you never sat in a superintendent's chair, you don't know how courageous that is. Because folk fight back on you all of the time. When I told Austin, congratulations, your principal said we're gonna rearrange our budget so we don't have to change anything, that's a huge feat, huge feat. So our time is up, so I'd like for everyone to thank our guests, and please feel free to talk to them after the session.